Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the University of Washington Taiwan Studies Program book lecture series. My name is James Lin. I am an assistant professor at the Jackson School of International Studies here at the University of Washington. And uh, today we have the great honor of welcoming Professor Seiji Shirane to talk about his newly published book, Imperial Gateway, Colonial Taiwan, and Japan's Expansion in South China and Southeast Asia, 1895 to 1945. Uh, before I introduce Professor Shirane, I'd just like to spend a couple minutes previewing some of our other Taiwan Studies program events for the this quarter and next quarter. Um, I'd also just uh, give a kind of brief reminder that we have uh, in-ceiling microphones in this room, and so uh, they will pick up kind of background talk. So uh, hopefully we can keep that a little bit on the down so that uh, when Professor Sharani speaks, the microphone will just pick up his talk. Um, so on February 28th, we have Professor uh, Lin Weiping from National Taiwan University giving a virtual talk based on her newly published book, Island Fantasia on Cold War Mazu. On April 13th, we'll have Professor um, Jin Wen Gong from National University of Singapore will give a virtual talk on his new book, Diasporic Cold Warriors, which discusses Taiwan's relations with the Philippines during the Cold War. And on May 11th, we'll have Dr. Ling Xiaoting from uh, the Hoover Institution at Stanford, who will be giving a talk on his new book, Taiwan, the United States, and the Hidden History of the Cold War in Asia. Uh, so we have a, a, a crowded slate of very exciting book talks for this quarter, next quarter. Um, hope to see all of you uh, online for those talks, as there will all be virtual talks. Um, so I'd like to introduce now Professor Seiji Shirani, Assistant Professor of Japanese History at the City College of New York, where his teaching and research interests include Japan's empire, Taiwan, and Sino-Japanese relations. Uh, Seiji received his BA from Yale University, his PhD from Princeton University, and his work has been supported by a number of different foundations such as the National Endowment for the Humanities, Fulbright Social Science Research Council, and the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Uh, I'm also very happy to, to say that I'm happy to see Seiji here in person in Seattle. I've known Seiji for uh, probably over a decade now, and so it's just also a, a personal kind of, um, uh, I feel very happy to be able to welcome Seiji here in person. So without further ado, uh, let's give a warm round of applause for Dr. Shirane. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome, James, uh, and thanks to the University of Washington Taiwan Studies Program, uh, uh, Ian, Daniel, and everyone for uh, making this happen. I, I really think it's a privilege, and uh, I was here three years ago, um, three and a half years ago, before the pandemic for a Taiwan Studies Conference, uh, and now, uh, three years later, with a three-year-old son and a book out, uh, much happier to, to be here in person with, with all this done. Um, so uh, I'll start with a cover that you see here um, of occupied Hainan Island, which is the southernmost island of China in 1940. As you can see, uh, Japanese soldiers on the right hand side and middle, and then over on the left, a Chinese POW with his hands tied behind his back. and how does Taiwan or, or, or the Taiwanese people, uh, how do they come to play in this book and in this picture? Well, the person with the uh, white armband, um, it says Tsu for Tsuyaku, uh, mil uh, interpreter, is a Taiwanese military interpreter. Uh, so my, my, my book and story is really talking about what's the role of Taiwan, Japanese colonial officials in Taiwan, as well as Taiwanese uh, civilians and military personnel in Japan's expansion into South China and then later Southeast Asia. How does this Taiwanese person get here? And what is the role, the mediating role of Taiwanese uh, in Japan's informal and formal expansion? So as the title suggests, I'm trying to look at Taiwan as an imperial gateway. And I think this sort of concept uh, or a phrase really can apply to um, almost any empire worldwide, uh, uh, and we'll talk about uh, which ones, um, how, uh, you know, it's not a linear expansion from the metropole Tokyo outwards, northern to Korea, Manchuria, or southwards, Okinawa, Taiwan, et cetera, but 
uh, each colony, uh, uh, its peoples and its colonial officials has different imperial ambitions and interests, sometimes uh, aligning with those in Tokyo, the foreign ministry, the army, navy, but oftentimes in competition. To, so to look at those uh, uh, tensions, the, the picture on the left here is uh, the Taiwan government general uh, um, headquarters, which is uh, today's uh, presidential office. Um, so as, as everyone in the Taiwan States program knows, Taiwan's really at the geographical um, intersection of East and Southeast Asia, and Japanese officials themselves are really looking to use and mobilize uh, its subjects and residents. Uh, here on the right-hand side is a postcard in the 1900s and in, in the Japanese Chinese characters of Han, uh, the Han race or Chinese peoples uh, in uh, Western Taiwan, and then the uh, raw savages or uh, barbarians, uh, uh, the indigenous Taiwanese, uh, you know, obviously derogatorily uh, named on the right hand side. So uh, uh, for most of the book, uh, I'll be looking at the Han uh, residents or Taiwanese and their overseas uh, 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 actions. But in Southeast Asia, in the wartime period, the indigenous Taiwanese will also come to play. I won't go over the the uh, uh, you know uh, the long history that. Uh, James teaches regularly uh, at this school, but we know that Taiwan's an island that has experienced multiple colonialisms, uh, early modern period um, to to really the present. Um, the the materials that I used in Taiwan um, would not have been possible without uh, the the opening up of Taiwan government general archives and the general colonial. Um, uh, uh, publications that are stored and accessible. Uh, those really opened up in the 1990s to the present, as well as a lot of Taiwanese oral histories and memoirs that uh, were transcribed in the 90s and 2000s. So uh, I obviously owe a lot to the archivists and, and scholars in Taiwan uh, who made this project possible. So uh, as, as you know, um, evidenced by this program, Taiwan Studies has been on the rise and, and thriving. Um, if we're looking at English language literature, uh, a lot of the, the pioneering studies were in literary cultural studies in the 2000s. Um, representation, uh, you know, the, the adoption of Saeed's Orientalism, of how Japanese orientalized the indigenous or Han other, um, and then also identity, uh, uh, especially that of intellectuals and writers. And since then, um, not just uh, uh, literary scholars, but historians of Japan, uh, historians of China and Taiwan uh, have really looked at um, both Japanese and Chinese language sources to, to uh, show the limits of state power and state control, uh, as well as the agency of Han and indigenous Taiwanese um, pre-war and also during the wartime period. Um, my work is building off of these as well as uh, uh, a few others that I'm especially interested in of mobility and border crossings by Taiwanese subjects uh, and Japanese from Okinawa to Taiwan or from Taiwan to China uh, or in, in Azuma's case, um, Japanese uh, uh, agricultural and uh, colonial knowledge and experience from Manchuria, from California, from Hawaii, uh, later exported to Taiwan. Um, but I, I'm, I'm in my book trying to look both at the state and the the uh, colonial subject perspective of uh, you know what what happens when we look beyond the borders of Taiwan uh, and take the regional uh, 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 framework seriously to not just look at um, Japan and Taiwan, oftentimes even the best works are really looking at uh, the impact of Japan on Taiwan and Taiwan on Japan, these bilateral or binary relations between Tokyo and Taipei. Um, whereas on the ground in Taiwan, China and Southeast Asia, these neighboring regions were just as important for Japanese expansion and Taiwanese subjects as the Japanese metropole. Um, in Tokyo, especially when we're thinking about the World War II and Asia Pacific War, uh, we know of heated rivalries between the Army and Navy, Northern and Southern expansion, 
as well as attempts by the foreign ministry, especially in China, to try to limit um, military ex uh, expansion in China. Uh, but we really have to look at the colonial governments uh, in Korea, in Taiwan, and elsewhere, because uh, these colonial governments also had uh, um, a stake and interests that were at times aligned, at times opposed to what was going on with the Army, Navy, and Foreign Ministry. So to bring the Taiwan government general in this inter-service, inter-imperial um, uh, inter uh, uh, rivalry story. So when we look at empires elsewhere, as the Japanese were, uh, the India Empire is uh, uh, looms large, and I've drawn inspiration from work by Thomas Metcalf and others who are looking at uh, the role of India's institutions and, of course, millions of Indian laborers and soldiers across the Indian Ocean um, and how instrumental they were in the making of uh, British Malaya, uh, South Africa, Kenya, uh, etc. Um, so they don't use the word gateway, but gateway can, of course, apply to India uh, as well as the French uh, Northern African territories uh, going from Algeria to Tunisia, Morocco. Um, many of the issues I'll talk about in terms of uh, uh, overseas colonial subjects, uh, extraterritoriality, uh, marketplace of nationality, these issues are going on at the same time in uh, the Indian uh, British Empire, in the French empires, uh, as well as China. Um, so just like uh, British, uh, the British Empire and French Empire, they're not you know, unilaterally or, or unilaterally uh, uh, expansion, uh, expanding, uh, northern and southern expansion are happening simultaneously, and uh, you know, in not 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 um, all planned from the uh, Tokyo Metropole. Um, a lot of it is improvised uh, uh, based on what is going on uh, with their Anglo-American rivals uh, and what's going on in China. Uh, so. I'm looking at the role of Taiwanese as um, imperial intermediaries in China and Southeast Asia. And there's you know, a really uh, thriving um, scholarship on colonial Korea and Koreans in Manchuria in China, which I try to uh, compare in the introduction and epilogue. And I'd be happy to talk more about in the Q&A. Uh, so who are the Taiwanese? Um, in, in my book, uh, I'm not talking about Taiwanese identity uh, per se or national consciousness, but really the political legal term for Han Chinese registered in Taiwan as Japanese nationals, Japanese colonial subjects. Um, as we know, they're second class uh, uh, subjects without the same education uh, uh, or salary rights as their ethnic Japanese counterparts. Um, and when I'm talking about overseas Taiwanese, it's, again, those who are legally Taiwanese with Japanese nationality who are residing in China and Southeast Asia, but some of them are local Chinese or overseas Chinese who have never actually been to Taiwan, but have adopted or naturalized as Taiwanese subjects. And many of them do so by acquiring legally or illegally through bribery or forgery uh, Japanese passports, as you see here. Um, and in, in the first half of my book, um, part one, uh, I show how uh, Taiwanese in South China and Southeast Asia are using um, colonial subjecthood and Japanese nationality for their own individual interests. Um, Japanese colonial and consular officials try to mobilize these Taiwanese as economic intermediaries, as political and cultural, cultural intermediaries, um, but things are not always going as planned. And so um, the first half of the book is talking about uh, both the surprises and, and unexpected um, you know, consequences of informal empire through, through, through the use of Taiwanese subjects in South China and Southeast Asia. So for the rest of the talk, I'll talk about um, bits of part two, the wartime gateway uh, during the, the dual war of the Second Sino-Japanese War and the Asia-Pacific War uh, and the role of Taiwanese uh, military uh, personnel. Uh, the materials that I draw on, um, uh, li like I mentioned before, the uh, Taiwan government general archives and libraries are really well preserved in a National Taiwan University in Academia Sinica. Um, of course, also use Japanese foreign ministry and military archives in Tokyo. Uh, and 
uh, especially when revising the dissertation into a book, um, trying to bring out as many Taiwanese voices as possible, I uh, read and, and uh, used as many Taiwanese oral histories uh, and memoirs um, as possible of uh, mil military personnel uh, in China and Southeast Asia. Um, this story is uh, one of imperial rivalry uh, between J Japan and especially the Anglo-American powers. So British and American consular records also record and show uh, what the Japanese and Taiwanese are doing in South China's treaty ports, uh, Southeast Asia. And so I use those to compare uh, what the Japanese and the Chinese uh, uh, archives are saying about uh, Taiw the Taiwanese um, activity in the pre-war and wartime period. Um, when I talk about Imperial Gateway or Taiwan as Imperial Gateway, um, there are parallels even within China of how Indochina, the French are uh, trying to use Indochina and to expand uh, and, and create a French sphere of inf influence in Southwest China, uh, the British through Hong Kong and South China, uh, and the Russians in, in the North. Um, but the main, main, main port cities um, in South China that we're talking about are today, uh, today's Fujian and Guangdong provinces, uh, Fuzhou, Xiamen, and Shantou, and Guangzhou. Um, one of the, the main strategies, the Japanese uh, uh, colonial government, especially in Taiwan, did not have a lot of resources initially, um, just uh, uh, you know, subjugating uh, Han and indigenous Taiwanese in Taiwan uh, took you know, tons of money from Tokyo. Uh, so there were not a lot of resources to spend on overseas expansion, but uh, a cheap imperialism on the cheap uh, or imperialism through proxy, this kind of strategy was to naturalize local, wealthy, well-connected uh, Chinese in Xiamen, for example. Uh, and they, uh, the Japanese consular and colonial officials happily granted uh, these uh, Chinese, mostly businessmen and elites, uh, uh, Taiwanese subjecthood. So you have overseas Taiwanese associations um, uh, popping up throughout South China with Chinese who are oftentimes dual nationals. And what's in it for them? Well, they they uh, gain or obtain extraterritorial protection, meaning uh, the Japanese, uh, after defeating China in 1920, uh, 1895, ha have extraterritorial protection, meaning they don't have to pay local Chinese taxes um, uh, and also they're protected by Japanese consular uh, uh, legal protections. And so the Taiwanese um, uh, or anybody who naturalized as a Taiwanese subject also uh, 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 enjoyed these privileges. Um, this is in contrast to British and American powers that are increasingly um, uh, racializing their nationality, meaning uh, they make it much, much harder for Chinese to naturalize or to keep uh, Western nationality and, and subjecthood. So uh, this is something that the Japanese are doing that the Anglo-American powers uh, are, are going against uh, by the 20th century. So um, whether Taiwanese are seeing themselves as Chinese or not, the Japanese, for the most part, value them precisely for their Chineseness. Uh, the idea that they speak the same Hokkien uh, or a Minnan uh, Taiwanese dialect as those in Xiamen, or can easily learn the, the Cantonese or, or Hakka uh, languages. Uh, and that with the, the vast overseas Chinese um, network in Southeast Asia, uh, the Taiwanese could potentially also be perfect intermediaries uh, in Singapore and beyond. So uh, with the outbreak of the Second Sino-Japanese War, um, Japan occupies uh, Northeast China, most of North and Central China, and then the uh, port city, cities uh, of South China. Um, this is a picture of uh, Xiamen being occupied. And there, initially, the Taiwan government general uh, has ambitions for more uh, legal uh, administrative control. They, they proposed for it. Uh, the Taiwan government general proposed a southern re regions government general, meaning that the Taiwan government general would uh, uh, directly administer occupied South China, uh, the South China Seas, like the Spratly Islands, and Micronesia as this one big southern uh, colony. And ultimately, uh, this is proposed, and the army and navy uh, reject it. Yet, 
uh, both the Army and Navy re heavily rely on Taiwan government general institutions and personnel to administer South China precisely because there's four decades of experience and, and networks between South China uh, and Taiwan. Um, High-ranking Taiwan government generals uh, uh, become uh, high-ranking officials in the, the occupied uh, occupation regimes in Xiamen. Uh, and you have thousands of Taiwanese policemen, uh, business officials, uh, teachers um, uh, sent from Taiwan to South China. So in terms of so-called puppet regimes or, or Chinese occupied uh, regimes, um, those in South China have the highest percentage of colonial subjects or Taiwanese than any other uh, uh, puppet regimes in China. What are some of the uh, motivations for Han and later indigenous Taiwanese for volunteering as military servicemen? Um, we know that there are you know, hundreds of thousands of volunteers and only you know, a, a certain small percentage accepted. Um, uh, this is part of the Japanese wartime assimilation and combing uh, 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 policy to try to mobilize Taiwanese as uh, so-called so true loyal Japanese. One is the financial incentive um, and, and opportunity for upward social mobility, the ability to be paid two to three times the amount of uh, wages uh, that they were paid in, in Taiwan. Others um, sign up as uh, military assistants, meaning that they're going to be unarmed uh, translators or interpreters, as you saw on the cover. Um, ultimately, they would oftentimes be armed, and even though they were legally non-military, uh, they were placed in positions just as dangerous as that of uh, military uh, um, serv military soldiers. But at the time of volunteering, many of them didn't know that. Uh, so they assumed that these non-military assistant positions might be safer. Um, and also others, they've been educated in Japanese and colonial uh, schools their, their whole lives. And so there is genuine Japanese patriotism. Um, efforts to prove that you know, Han or indigenous Taiwanese are just as loyal and capable as their uh, uh, Japanese counterparts. So this is uh, a, a, a volunteer application with a blood plea, meaning, you know, you cut and, and sort of uh, uh, stamp parts of your uh, blood on your hand to really show your dedication, willingness to, to fight and die for the uh, Japanese emperor. This is a picture of uh, uh, military interpreters in wartime South China. Uh, as I said, uh, the assumption was that Taiwanese already spoke the local dialects in Fujian. Um, of course, the reality was much more complex. Um, some of the oral histories and testimonies, for example, by uh, Hu Xiandu, um, who was a Navy interpreter in 1940, talked about um, being trained uh, in multiple Chinese dialects in Taiwan. So the, the Fuzhou dialect, the Xiamen dialect, the, the Cantonese dialect, the Hainan dialect before going to South China uh, and also undergoing training in uh, intelligence, propaganda, use of military weapons. Um, but things are not always, uh, they, they don't necessarily go so smoothly. Once, for example, Ku goes to Hainan, he initially can't really understand the Hainan dialect. Also, Chinese POWs uh, are coming from, uh, uh, you know, KMT uh, uh, soldiers are coming from throughout China. So there is a linguistic uh, barrier uh, for sure. Um, what are some of the tensions, interethnic tensions between Taiwanese and Japanese and Taiwanese and Chinese? Well, with Japanese, um, many low-ranking Japanese soldiers uh, who, who recalls um, resented Taiwanese interpreters because even though Taiwanese interpreters ranked below that of Japanese soldiers, they were actually paid higher salaries uh, for work deemed dangerous. So there's a resentment there. Uh, and also this idea that um, Han Taiwanese uh, might be pro-China, uh, you know, have uh, loyalty towards their Han counterparts and that they couldn't uh, necessarily be trusted um, as truly, truly uh, loyal Japanese. On the other hand, uh, the Taiwanese are the ones who are interfacing with Chinese POWs the most um, in terms of speaking, um, direct contact, overseeing uh, POW labor, uh, you know, giving them food and medicine. So they also become the biggest targets of Chinese antipathy. And once uh, the Japanese empire is defeated and falls in 1945, uh, 
Taiwanese understandably are going to be the first ones sort of targeted by local Chinese in, in South China uh, and, and beyond. Um, it's very hard to generalize the Taiwanese experience um, on the war front. Um, some Taiwanese uh, really felt that it was a, a, a you know, great opportunity and, and were, were happily uh, uh, fighting on behalf of Japan. Others like Tsai in um, his oral testimony talks about, you know, he was paid three times the wages that he was paid as a policeman in Taiwan, but he felt conflicted about interrogating, even executing Chinese POWs because of this Han Chinese um, uh, self-identity, you know, identifying with with uh, uh, the Chinese POW. So um, they're caught really in between uh, uh, Japan and China here. There are not that many women that uh, uh, come into the story, except for the wartime period. Uh, you have um, nurse assistants, uh, volunteers as well, um, who also fit this imperial hierarchy on the war front. Uh, they're oftentimes, they're clearly second class to their Japanese counterparts in that they are assisting Japanese nurses, uh, yet they're also overseeing local Chinese um, nurses. So uh, there's also an opportunity. Um, and even though they are still colonized, uh, you know, there is, is power that they're uh, uh, wielding above uh, their Chinese, Chinese civilians and, and um, POWs, uh, not as not as publicized as Korean comfort women. Um, you know, there's estimated several thousand uh, Taiwanese comfort women, both Han and Indigenous, uh, who um, were based in comfort stations in South China, especially Hainan Island, uh, as well as Southeast Asia. Um, uh, luckily, you know, I, I there's there's been. Uh, uh, oral testimony and documentation, as well as uh, documentaries uh, that have been made um, of many of these covered women, former covered women who have who have uh, uh, since passed. Um, and although they are, uh, for the most part, in a very different situation, they're you know inter they're not volunteering necessarily to be a covered women. Many of them are are uh, uh, you know tricked by. Taiwanese recruiters as well as Japanese recruiters that uh, they there's opportunity to work at restaurants or as nurses in in the war fund and instead they are then uh, uh, forced into uh, you know becoming these military sex slaves. Uh, yet in the the oral testimonies they too fit in this imperial hierarchy of uh, ethnic Japanese comfort women being paid the most and then after that Koreans and Taiwanese. Uh, uh, having the second highest wages after, uh, and then below them are Chinese and allied uh, 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 Western comfort women. So whether or not they, they receive these wages later or not um, is a separate question, but uh, uh, they were viewed by the Japanese on the war front as being second class and superior, you know, in terms of colonial status to that of uh, Chinese and allied POWs. So once uh, there's a two, you know, two front war with uh, the Western allied uh, allies, you also have uh, tens of thousands of military assistants and servicemen in Southeast Asia. Um, similar to South China, you have a lot of interpreters um, used to uh, speak and mediate between overseas Chinese, uh, but also um, uh, laborers as well as agricultural uh, managers uh, who are then um, uh, deployed to places like uh, Indochina, uh, and then you have you know an unexpected uh, you know huge number of Allied POWs uh, and and lacking manpower. Taiwanese and Koreans are also enlisted and and sent as POW prison guards um, to oversee Allied POWs. And here's also where we have several thousand Indigenous Taiwanese uh, who serve in Southeast Asia. This is a picture from the National um, uh, Singapore Archives um, of a very prominent uh, uh, overseas Chinese um, uh, uh, a physician, Lim Boom King, um, and Japanese military army officers um, uh, left to the middle, to second to right. And then uh, a Taiwanese interpreter, uh, Tui, uh, on the right, 
he, he is um, basically the, the uh, go-between go between Lim and the Japanese military. And Tui's job is to get Lim to recruit and to gather as many um, uh, uh, so-called donations or funds from uh, wealthy overseas Chinese in Singapore. So um, Taiwanese play uh, uh, a linguistic and cultural sort of uh, role in places like Singapore. Uh, they also play, they, they also serve as prison guards. And many of these prison guards who um, participate in the execution or torture of allied POWs are later uh, sentenced as BC or so-called minor war criminals in the post-1945 period. Uh, so you also have testimony of what these Taiwanese prison guards did. Uh, I, you know, from their perspective, um, they were just following orders. They didn't know about the Geneva Convention or human rights, uh, you know, under under wartime conditions. Uh, but they're judged by the Allied POW, uh, Allied powers post nineteen forty five as uh, uh, as Japanese uh, and, and are either sentenced to death or or a long prison prison terms. Um, and you have a lot of oral testimony by uh, Anglo American um, POWs who, you know, as, as recently as even the 2000s talk about uh, how Korean or Taiwanese guards at times were, were even crueler than their, their Japanese um, uh, overseers. Uh, this is a picture of indigenous Taiwanese um, volunteers in Southeast Asia. Uh, the reason why uh, Japanese uh, military and colonial personnel uh, recruit indigenous Taiwanese to, for places like the Philippines or New Guinea is that it's under the logic of uh, uh, that the indigenous Taiwanese have tropical uh, skills and also linguistic affinities. Uh, so one one is that um, uh, you know the the skills in tropical warfare or mountain warfare uh, would be useful, uh, and you have testimonies by Japanese officers as well as. Uh, Han and indigenous Taiwanese that um, they were uh, much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, skilled in in navigating the jungles and helping uh, construct and transport uh, military um, materials in the mountainous jungles of the Philippines and New Guinea. Uh, also, this idea that there's a shared uh, Austronesian linguistic background uh, with uh, local uh, indigenous peoples in the Philippines or New Guinea, and that uh, within months. Um, some indigenous Taiwanese were able to communicate with uh, uh, um, local indigenous people. So uh, there, even though they're not a large number, only about an estimated four to 5,000, uh, they do play a role in Southeast Asia. They also participate in uh, some of the last, uh, you know, suicide kamikaze attacks of the Philippines. And so there's a steep cost, of, uh, of course, a steep cost to the military service with um, an estimated 30,000 Han and indigenous Taiwanese uh, uh, dying among the 200,000 sent, sent overseas. Um, so in, to, to conclude the talk, um, I'm just talking about uh, how imperial colonial hierarchy is really vary across time and region, whether it's in the pre-war or wartime period. And uh, of course, this is in sort of broad generalizations of saying that the Japanese uh, uh, in terms of the Japanese imperial hierarchy were uh, you know, in the first, first class followed by the Han Taiwanese and indigenous Taiwanese. If we, we can clearly break down the Japanese into uh, sub-ethnic or sub-regional categories when you think about Okinawans who come from Okinawa to, Japan, uh, to Taiwan, uh, et cetera. But generally speaking, there are these uh, hierarchies that are in play. Um, but outside Taiwan, especially in the wartime period, uh, there are lots of opportunities for Han and indigenous Taiwanese and, um, you know, to, to explain for uh, many of the reasons why they volunteered and participated um, in, in uh, the wartime occupation of uh, South China and Southeast Asia. Um, after 1945, uh, I talk in the epilogue about some of the, the uh, um, aftermaths and, and repercussions um, in the wartime period. Uh, meeting between Japan and the Chinese or Japan and the Anglo-American powers. Uh, in the post-war period, uh, as I foreshadowed, Taiwanese become primary targets of Chinese and Western retaliation. So in South China, 
uh, many of them are tried as uh, or or imprisoned as um, Han Jin or Han Han traders, uh, and and in Southeast Asia, uh, a lot of them are uh, tried as um, uh, war criminals, uh, and uh, so in in that sense, the Taiwanese were caught in between um, Japan and China in 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 pre-war South China are now caught in between uh, multiple. Uh, whether it's the ROC, later PRC, and then the Anglo-American, Dutch, French powers, um, they face you know the, these uh, retaliatory uh, uh, repercussions in in the post-war period. So uh, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to your Q and A. Thank you. It's a it's a great point. Um, when we say volunteer, of course, uh, that's the Japanese official term for these positions. And uh, many of, whether it's interpreters or uh, policemen or soldiers or nurses, uh, many of them did feel a lot of pressure, right? So um, a lot of nurses are, are uh, recruited from uh, secondary schools, well-educated, bilingual Taiwanese females. Uh, and teachers are telling them, putting a lot of pressure and saying, if you don't go, you're not loyal. If you don't go, you're not a real Japanese subject. So uh, to, to, you know, I think your, your, your friend's, um, you know, relative's experience is, is true in that um, they could be in official legal status, a, a nurse volunteer, whereas they themselves might not have really wanted to be a nurse. Right? Um, and that was certainly the case of some soldiers and prison guards where they face uh, pressure from their family who want them to go for the uh, uh, prestige or the wages or from their school or from uh, police officials who are coming around and trying to recruit. Thank you. I think I saw another hand. Oh, yes, Mark, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. thank you. This is an interesting talk. And um, I, one of the things you said early on, I was really interested in hearing more about when you talked about the wealthy businessmen in Xiamen and other places becoming overseas Taiwanese, naturalized overseas Taiwanese. And um, I'd just like to hear more about that and maybe what are the business advantages of that? Does that work together with certain business strategies or does that relate to overseas business in Southeast Asia or? or other places, there must be all kinds of dimensions, I, I imagine. So the question from Professor Metzler asks about um, the wealthy, the local wealthy Chinese in South China and places like Xiamen, what were the kinds of business advantages that they had uh, as a result of presumably taking on um, overseas Taiwanese status? Okay, great. So um, uh, there's a, a thriving opium trade uh, uh, throughout China, of course, but especially in South China. And um, there are Qing and then later ROC attempts at anti-opium uh, uh, prohibition and suppression efforts, or uh, efforts at, uh, by Chinese officials to gain uh, control over the opium trade themselves. So uh, if a, a shaman, local Chinese uh, entrepreneur or businessman has Japanese nationality, uh, they're immune or can get Japanese protection um, for uh, dealing in illegal, you know, uh, narcotics. Uh, and so um, there, there's the legal business advantage of uh, not having to pay taxes. There, there's an increasing uh, high opium tax uh, also among uh, Chinese entrepreneurs. Uh, but if they have a non-Chinese um, nationality, they don't have to pay the local Chinese tax. And... Uh, if you know their their opium den or opium business is deemed illegal, uh, they can get protection from Japanese consulates. So uh, what's interesting is sometimes Japanese consular officials don't want to give them that protection. So they want to, you know, the, the, these opium entrepreneurs are more of a headache and not really worth it to them. But the Taiwan government general and uh, officials in Taiwan uh, 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 are pro protecting. Um, one is uh, the, the Japanese are not necessarily um, uh, profiting or getting a, a, a take, uh, you know, a cut of the opium 
uh, revenues. In, in, Manchu, in Man Manchuria, the Guangdong army is seen as uh, very locally, uh, uh, closely tied to Korean and local uh, uh, Japanese opium uh, uh, businesses. And in South China, uh, the Japanese and Taiwan government in general are not taking a cut of the opium uh, revenues, but it, uh, uh, it, by, by granting um, legal and military protection, uh, these overseas uh, Taiwanese will then um, donate a lot of money or found overseas Taiwanese schools, hospitals, uh, banks. Uh, and so it's a give and take of uh, 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 between uh, local Chinese and Taiwanese. Um, sometimes uh, these Chinese Taiwanese, they, they almost all of them maintain dual nationality. And so the, uh, it's advantageous for the Japanese to have uh, Taiwanese who have Chinese nationality because um, you need Chinese nationality to, uh, for example, uh, build uh, or, or buy property uh, outside treaty ports. So uh, when the Taiwan government in general is trying to expand its camphor, uh, uh, industry in Fujian, uh, they get they get uh, local Chinese Taiwanese to to buy property that Japanese can't buy, um, uh, uh, and so so, but but um, again, uh, you know, chapters one and two talk about how uh, at times it, it, you know uh, the J Japan the foreign ministry complains about um, you know it, it's it's uh, bringing down the reputation of Japan. Uh, these gangsters or, or uh, bandits are, are, are a problem, uh, but you have uh, other officials in Taiwan who are who, who want to protect them or use them uh, uh, for Japanese interests. Yeah, Hanjin, please. Thank you so much for your talk. I actually also have a related question on the overseas Taiwanese. I want to ask uh, kind of what happens to them after 1945 in terms of their nationality status. So do they, did they simply revert to having Ch Chinese nationality or did some of them actually go to Taiwan? Okay, great question. So, oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, let me just repeat the, the question really quickly for our online audience. Sorry, Seiji. Um, Professor Jun asks, uh, what happens to um, those holding Overseas status after 1945. Um, so uh, it's it's a complicated question in that uh, uh, they are they are treated in, in South China. They are they are treated as Chinese nationals who um, were Han traders. So so many of them um, are initially imprisoned and then are going to go. Uh, uh, go through trials as fellow Chinese nationals. Um, but then uh, the uh, local KMT uh, officials in 1945 uh, deemed that they should be they can't be tried as Han, Han Jen or Han traders because they were Japanese nationals at the time that they committed these crimes, whether it's uh, collaborating or, or executing uh, Chinese POW. So um, you have about 42 uh, uh, Taiwanese who are um, sentenced as BC war criminals in China, and then uh, over a hundred in other parts of Southeast Asia. So in the end, uh, Taiwanese are not um, uh, uh, deemed to be Han traders, but rather uh, Japanese nationals at the time. Uh, after after they're tried, if they're not executed, uh, then they are uh, um, they they become ROC nationals. Uh, but that too is tricky. Um, uh, many of them uh, disappear from the record. Uh, uh, presumably, they you know took on different names and tried to blend in with the Chinese community. So uh, a lot of them, you know, because only only you only have a couple hundred um, who are who are uh, imprisoned in China, and you had tens of thousands before. So presumably. Probably a lot of them didn't go back to Taiwan, but just fled or uh, adopted different names. You have Taiwanese in Southeast Asia who uh, also adopted local Chinese names and tried to pass as um, Singaporean Chinese or uh, Malay uh, Chinese. Um, and then uh, a few go back to Taiwan, but uh, it, it's hard to uh, uh, cover their paper trail precisely because many of them don't show up post 1945. Other questions? Yeah, Christoph, please. Just to follow up, I mean, this, this is a really interesting uh, issue, right? The repatriation of what happens to these changing statuses after 1945. But I mean, do, do you see evidence of 
um, a, a, a repatriation to Japan from after 1945. I mean, there are so many parallels also to the entanglements of uh, in after World War II in Europe, right? We had collaborating French anti-communists and Ukrainians and Russians, and suddenly they become POWs together with all the German POWs. And then the question is, where do they get repatriated? I would think if you talked about 200,000 who are originating from Taiwan who are caught up in the war service, uh, that that you would expect that some of them would not would resist having to go back to Taiwan, which has now changed to a different regime and, uh, and would rather be in the protection of Japan. Uh, so Professor Giebel asks about um, explaining again on this repatriation question, uh, did Taiwanese seek to be repatriated back to Japan? Presumably some of them resisted repatriation back to Taiwan and he draws parallels as well to what happened in Europe with the repatriation of different um, groups like Ukrainians and others. Um, do you see a kind of parallel situation there? Oh, it's a great question. So uh, because the, the there's, there's so many um, uh, uh, you know, channels of repatriation, it, I, 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 it's somewhere in the epilogue, but I'll, I'll do my best to, to explain orally. Um, so for example, you have, uh, um, uh, Taiwanese prison guards in, for example, Southeast Asia, who are then sentenced as Japanese war criminals. And those who are sentenced as war criminals are then, they uh, sent to serve in Tokyo, in the Tsugamo prison um, uh, up through 1950s. And once they're released, they are then repatriated to Taiwan. Uh, those who are not even sentenced as war criminals or um, in prison as war criminals, uh, they all um, are, are initially sent back to Japan and then repatriated uh, to Taiwan. So um, depending on when they're released, uh, it's true. It, 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 you know, do they want to go back to a, a ROC rule of Taiwan? Um, 228 incidents or 1947 has already happened. And for some, uh, some choose to go to the PRC. Some choose to stay in Japan. Um, uh, the legality of how and, and whether they're allowed to stay in Japan or go to the PRC uh, uh, is, is very tricky. Um, there is a documentary uh, called Shonen Ko about um, Taiwanese uh, youth laborers who uh, work in um, military factories in Japan. And, and the documentary um, talks about how after 1945, uh, some of them go back to Taiwan, but some of them go to the PRC and some of them stay in Japan. So uh, uh, again, how and why uh, they, they do that it is a complex legal situation, but the, the repatriation is definitely not a, 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 a you know, simple process. Yes, Mina. Um, this is totally, um, maybe this is a naive question and not really sure, but um, coming from somebody out of the field. But I was actually really interested in how you're talking about um, Taiwanese getting Japanese passports, um, because that's not possible today. Uh, and so I'm kind of, I'm just wondering if you could talk more about that process, if there's some kind of legacy of the people of those descendants who are able to have Japanese passports or they're not able to have Japanese passports. So it's kind of question of um, naturalization. Uh, I, I, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Professor Tusev asks um, if, you could talk a little bit more about um, Taiwanese obtaining Japanese passports. That's something that's not possible today. What are the kinds of implications of that? And yeah. Um, so the passport system was really interesting. Um, it's used, uh, it's based on the Hong Kong, British Hong Kong, Singapore model uh, um, uh, to, uh, to survey and to uh, prevent undesirable colonial subjects from leaving Taiwan initially. So uh, anytime uh, a, a Taiwanese subject wants to go to China, they need to um, uh, apply for and receive a passport and then gain, gain a visa permission to go to China. Uh, and so um, for the most part, uh, if, if a Taiwanese subject wants to study or work in China, um, these, these applications are rejected. Uh, the only reasons for them to, to get the passport uh, successfully is usually for business 
uh, uh, business reasons. Um, uh, so so it, it's it's a, uh, try to control their mobility, um, but also it's a document and to, uh, uh, you know for for example uh, overseas Taiwanese in, in in South China also needed a passport. Um, for, to, to prove their Japanese legality and nationality. Um, uh, so they would apply for them, but you also had others who would reuse or forge di different kinds of Japanese passports. Um, so in that sense, uh, the Japanese, you know, tried to control who could have a passport or not, but uh, it was in flux and, and much easier to get than now. Um, there are those who sidestep the passport uh, uh, um, track, uh, you could you could go from Taiwan to Japan without a passport because it's seen as the same, you know, uh, imperial territory. And so people who wanted to study or work in China and who were, couldn't, couldn't get a Japanese border passport visa, many of them will go to Nagasaki. And then Japanese at the time, they didn't need to show uh, a, a, a passport or visa to enter China at the time. This is part of their extraterritorial uh, um, privileges. So a Taiwanese person who went to Nagasaki and then pretended to be a Japanese going into China could then enter China. So there are all these loopholes to the passport system. Um, but uh, it, it's a good question of whether uh, descendants of the you know Taiwanese basically after after. Um, uh, uh, 1945 and then Japan's um, uh, peace treaty with the ROC, uh, Taiwanese residents are, uh, you know, almost for the, uh, the majority are, are ROC citizens, so uh, lose all Japanese nationality. So they, they, don't, they don't get to continue to have that um, legal status in the post-war period. I'll take a couple of questions from our online audience. Um, the first one is uh, from someone who was an alum of the North American Taiwan Studies Association meeting, which is held here back in 2019. Um, so uh, Sun Suwei asked, in the slide that you showed to us on the blood plea, um, the, the content of the letter actually asks the commander to, quote, use me as a porter, end quote. Um, and so the question is, the Han Chinese Taiwanese were, were not recruited as soldiers until early 1945, when the empire had no choice. Um, would you comment on this hesitation to give firearms and weapons to colonial subjects? Okay, that's a great question. So um, this is where you know there, there are very few um, official uh, documents or declarations uh, of Koreans as being higher in status to the Taiwanese. Um, but if you look at military policy, um, Koreans are able to uh, uh, enlist as um, army volunteers or army armed soldiers in the army in 1938. In Taiwan, it's only 1942. And then uh, for the Navy, Korea, uh, uh, Koreans can enlist in the Navy in 1942 and Taiwan is 1944, right? So why give Koreans these privileges years before Taiwan. In fact, if you look at, look at um, uh, uh, um, language statistics, the percentage of Taiwanese males uh, uh, who are fluent in Japanese is much higher than in Korea. So if you wanted people who could understand commands or, or be potentially useful uh, 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 soldiers, um, you, you would draw Taiwan soldiers first, but there was this um, uh, uh, fear that uh, the the pro Han um, Han identity would uh, uh, make Taiwanese uh, less loyal or perhaps more um, uh, uh, you know uh, subversive than Koreans. Um, so so uh, a roundabout way way of saying that um, until the the uh, 1942, the 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 highest rank or the 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 volunteer opportunities were that of military assistants and uh, that of porters or interpreters, unarmed unarmed uh, civilians who were, who were attached to the military. Uh, but in reality, those porters or military farmers or military interpreters who were not armed, uh, once they get to the, the, the war front and 
the Japanese don't have enough servicemen. Uh, many of these are armed right away and are in, you know, equally uh, uh, perilous situations. Um, so that there is a comparison to be made of, of uh, you know, Korean mobilization with Taiwan mobilization, uh, like Tak Fujitani's book. You can, you, I, I try to compare and contrast the, the, the policies that are going on uh, in Korea versus Taiwan. So uh, the next question is also from our online audience from Zhen Haowen, um, who says, uh, really enjoyed the presentation. Um, his question is, how has this, or how does the study of Taiwanese Imperial Japanese servicemen uh, might contribute not just to kind of our academic understanding of history, but um, maybe contribute towards, uh, or what can people living in Taiwan today, kind of a contemporary question, take away from understanding this history? Okay, so the reason why I, I was able to, you know, bring na real names and, and uh, memories or testimonies into the book uh, is precisely because of, uh, the, um, uh, in the 1990s and 2000s, there's a huge memory boom in Taiwan. Uh, and, and James is the foremost expert in explaining this, but uh, you, know, you couldn't talk about uh, the colonial period, your experience um, pre-1945 uh, really under um, martial law from uh, 40, you know, the late 40s to the late 80s, um, you, the, the KMT ROC line was, you know, you were either, uh, you fought valiantly and, and resisted the Japanese and the anti-Japanese war, or you were a Han trader, uh, and, and even the Taiwanese are sort of placed in those uh, uh, black and white categories. Uh, so, What's tricky about the oral histories is now in the 1990s and 2000s when, you know, Taiwanese identity and uh, nation building, is, you know, and, and the use of history uh, uh, starts to um, bloom, Taiwanese scholars are asking these former servicemen, nurses, military assistants about how the war or how colonial rule impacted their identity. Um, and many of them are talking about whether it was, you know, whether Japanese rule was was cruel or not, for better or for worse. Uh, it it contributed or was very significant in making them Taiwanese and not Chinese, right? This is what differentiated their their hi history, experience, and identity from that of mainland Chinese. So, I I try to. Um, give voice to these oral histories, but I try to stay away from uh, using or talking about identity per se, because it's it's using the 1990s and 2000s as a filter to read back into the 1930s and 1940s. Um, so, so the oral histories are really, really, really uh, uh, um, tough to use because I don't want to say, oh, uh, you know, it's because of uh, these experiences that the Taiwanese are pro-Japan or the Taiwanese want to be independent. I think a lot of conservative Japanese nationalists will, uh, nationalists will use that um, as, as propaganda, but the reason why there's so much anti-ROC or KMT uh, sentiment is, is really what happens after 1945, which is also in these oral histories. Right? If there wasn't a lot of negative trauma uh, due to what, what their experiences were like after they went back to Taiwan after 1945, 1947, um, how they talked about their wartime period and Japan today would, would also be totally different. Uh, so they, that's I, I can't really answer the question clearly, but it, it, it's to say that these oral histories are very valuable, but uh, also need to be sort of uh, uh, used with care. Um, maybe I could ask, use this opportunity to ask a follow-up question. Um, you know, the scholarship of Leo Ching has really opened up an understanding of what it was like to experience Japanese imperialism as a Taiwanese subject. And I wanted to ask you about perhaps the, the psychological and the affective um, consequences of being a part of the Japanese empire in South China or in Southeast Asia. Do you see how this affected kind of personal 
emotional and psychological conditions from from your from your study. Um, I mean, we Liu Qing is is really interesting because he utilizes a, a semi autobiographical account from Wu Zuoliu, an orphan of Asia, where the protagonist, based on Wu Zuoliu's life himself, um, experiences that alienation when he is occupying this kind of liminal space as both kind of Han Chinese, I mean, he partially identifies as that, but also partially identifies as Japanese, and then is seen as neither by both sides, and instead what he considers to be an orphan of Asia. Do you see that in kind of these oral histories and in your book? Oh, that's a great question. So um, that alienation uh, definitely uh, you see in the oral histories, especially, for example, the um, Hu Xiandu, the Navy interpreter who talks about uh, not being able to, uh, uh, you know, he's not welcomed by his Japanese counterparts, but also faces hostility by the Chinese POWs and Chinese civilians. So uh, there's a real bitterness to uh, 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 really gain the worst from both sides. Um, uh, so there, there are parallels with um, the Wu Zhuoliu and others who, who, for example, travel to China uh, either with initially with idealized images of you know going to their uh, Han homeland, homeland uh, but then seeing how, how different or underdeveloped, uh, for example, Nanjing is compared to Taipei. Uh, so that kind of uh, you know, what what I think is interesting is um, some of these Han Taiwanese um, unconsciously uh, uh, admit that they've internalized this Japanese civilizational Orientalism, where they go and talk about how undeveloped and poor and dirty, for example, Hainan is compared to Taiwan, um, or or and, and talking about even locals, uh, for example, Indonesians in in, in that sense, and so. I try to be critical of how some of these Han, Han Taiwanese have internalized the same sort of racist logic that the Japanese have have, have uh, uh, propagated or, or educated them with. And and with Wu Zhuoliu, he's not really he's he's sort of a victim, but he's never a perpetrator in that sense because um, he's not on the front lines. Or uh, but so I I do try to uh, come down a, a bit critically. On some of the Taiwanese, uh, again, it's 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 hard because it's part of the oral histories. You you see less of this alienation among the indigenous Taiwanese oral histories. They don't. I mean, it, it's it's understandable. They don't feel affinity with the Han Chinese. They're not sent to China, uh, so there's not this um, in betweenness that they feel. It's there's unconditional. Many of them don't learn Mandarin or are, are really alienated in the post-war period and totally idealize or talk about the Japanese experience in a, in a sort of utopic, idealized way. And, and again, I'm not criticizing that. Uh, it's just much less uh, uh, bitter than that of the Han Taiwanese. I, I don't, I'll be the first to say that there's, of, co of course, a lot of anti-Japanese sentiment and, and uh, understand, you know, uh, understandably, especially when it comes to, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the anniversary of uh, the Musha Rebellion, Musha Rebellion, you know, I, 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 I've been in Taiwan where I've seen descendants of those, uh, 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 you know, tribes talk about how, 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 how much they hate Japan. So I don't want to come across saying that all indigenous Taiwanese are pro-Japanese. It's not like that at all, but but the oral histories uh, definitely read a, a bit differently between the Han and indigenous Taiwanese. Yeah, I think it's no coincidence that the opening anecdote to uh, Liu Qing's becoming Japanese is of uh, indigenous kind of anecdotes of the, the widows of his team in Gasaguri tribe. Yeah. Um, yes, Ben. I actually wanted to ask about the indigenous uh, Taiwanese experience uh, during Japan. Um, you talked about indigenous volunteers. Um, my, it's probably one part of my question is just a very simple, I'm guessing those are part of the collaborative groups with the, uh, well, my understanding of the indigenous Taiwanese during the period is that there were collaborators with the Japanese and there were those who were um, subjects of extermination by the Japanese, for lack of a better term. Um, so I'm guessing those volunteers were more from the collaborative groups rather from the groups that were targeted by the Japanese um, in their attempts to, uh, for example, build the Tailuka Highway. 
Um, and then it's kind of another question is you talked about the Han Taiwanese relationships um, and how those before the war, during the war, were used to develop relationships in Southeast Asia and China. Um, and were indigenous Taiwanese just used during the war for those um, jungle missions for um, invading into um, Southeast Asia, or were they also um, used as soft diplomacy, uh, soft diplomatic um, agents? <laughs> uh, so I'll repeat uh, two questions from Benton. The first one is about whether um, the kind of relationship between indigenous Taiwanese and uh, the, the Japanese empire, um, whether there were kind of those who resisted and those who collaborated. Um, and then the second question is with regards to the roles that indigenous Taiwanese played, were they just kind of in military soldier roles or did they also have other roles like kind of more soft, soft power roles? Okay, um, so uh, yeah, it, it, the, the, those who are uh, volunteering for the indigenous um, Taiwanese volunteer groups, 1940s are born in the 1930s, right? Or, or, or late 1920s. So, um, you know, from from the their their descendants of uh, indigenous Taiwanese groups that that uh, survived. Mm -hmm. So whether they were resistors or collaborators, you know, they almost all of them went to Japanese language primary school uh, or indigenous uh, Japanese language schools. Um, so they, they're they're a couple of generations removed from those who were massacred. You know, in 1915, 1930, uh, uh, and so um, it, it would be hard to trace some of them. You know, so it, and I, they, this might have even come up in Leo Ting's book of some of them are uh, sons of those who uh, participated in the 1930 Wuxia uprising. So their father might have been truly anti-Japanese, but they might have volunteered. And, and had a totally different outlook on, on the um, uh, uh, wartime effort. Um, they, they, they do not really play a pre-war uh, role, um, especially in South China, but even in Southeast Asia. Um, they don't really have legal status as colonial subjects. So under the Qing, they're not seen as, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, they don't have legal resident sub subjecthood and the Japanese sort of adopt and continue that policy. So it's not really until the 1910s and 20s that indigenous Taiwanese gain the same legal uh, uh, um, family registration rights. Um, and they're not going overseas, especially to South, South China or Southeast Asia. So uh, that's that's partly why they don't play a pre-war or informal role in the way that the Han Taiwan Thank you. Yeah. Question. Thanks. How did you originally get interested in this work, zooming way out and getting personal? Sure. So the question is, how did you originally get into this project? Um, so, so I, you know, because this is a Taiwan Studies program, I, I didn't want to come into the talk and say, you know, when I entered grad school, I didn't really th think about Taiwan or I wasn't interested in Taiwan. But <laughs> the, the, the picture actually. Um, or the cover uh, uh, it can explain how I got into it in that uh, I had spent several years in Japan and several years, years in China um, working and, and studying. And uh, I was really interested in Sino-Japanese relations going into uh, uh, graduate school. Um, and there had been so much great work on uh, Japan's occupation in Manchuria in Northeast China. Uh, Japanese relations with Shanghai, and then the wartime period, Nanjing Massacre, all this stuff. Uh, so when I started, I was like, well, how, how can I try to do something that's new or a, a bit different in Sino-Japanese relations? And and after the first year of, my, uh, of grad school, I, I did field work in uh, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, but then also Taipei and Tokyo. And it was in Taipei where, uh, you know, some so much well-preserved archival and uh, library public, uh, you know, published material by the Taiwan government in general, so much of it was on South China and Southeast Asia. And that was when the first time I was like, wow, like I didn't realize there was so much interest in South China and Southeast Asia and all of it based in Taiwan. So uh, 
it really got me interested in Taiwan as not and 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 of course for more than just the gateway into South China for Taiwan itself, but that was the impetus to think about a new way of looking at South Sino-Japanese relations. And initially, I wanted to do Japan, Taiwan, and then you know its relations with South China. But I thought I had to spend the chapters on Southeast Asia because the Japanese and people in Taiwan saw South China, Southeast Asia as one extended region that I couldn't, it would be artificial to sort of just block off South China because it was seen as Nanxi, Nanyo, or Nanju, Nanyang as one, one region. And then that became Nampo or Nanfang or Southern region. So, so if the Japanese saw South China and Southeast Asia as connected and really, um, you know, not connected, not just geographically, but because uh, there's so much great scholarship in Chinese and Sinophone studies on um, South China and Southeast Asian overseas Chinese networks, but the, there's very little of that comes into Japanese studies. But the Japanese themselves from 1895 to 1945 are, are sort of pioneering the Japanese studies of Southeast Asia as, as an extension of South China and trying to use you know, Han in Taiwan, Han Chinese in South China, and Han Chinese in Southeast Asia, which are not not the same, but in their their eyes, uh, uh, a potentially you know useful imperial sort of mobilization tool. So uh, you know that it was sort of accidental, and then um, also access of just how how connected uh, Taiwanese scholars and scholarship is with with Japan. Uh, so to draw on their great secondary scholarship, the oral histories, um, and really in a way that uh, has not been introduced or, or, or you know, um, uh, taken advantage of in, in English as much as uh, it should be. So um, in that sense, I was trying to do a service of, of drawing on uh, 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 Taiwan primary and secondary sources uh, and to use that to contribute to Japanese imperial studies and then Sino-Japanese studies. Yes, Mark. So I just wanted to follow up on that, actually, that um, I guess those government general reports on South China and Southeast Asia, there's, um, I wonder if you could comment on the intelligence aspect of, of that. And, and it makes me think also that connected to your story, I don't know if you got into it, that there must be all kinds of military intelligence aspects, and espionage aspects, and so on. I wonder if you got into that at all. So Professor Metzler asks if you could get uh, comments a little bit more about the intelligence reports uh, about South China, Southeast Asia, uh, maybe military intelligence as well. No, thanks for that question. Um, you know, from modern Japanese studies and, and China studies, we know that uh, we know the intellectual, genealogical uh, sort of origins of uh, Toyoshi or East Asia Sinology how uh, the South Manchuria Railway Company and Mantetsu, uh, they, they produce so much uh, ethnological, historical, linguistic, archeological studies that uh, of China and Northeast Asia and Korea that, that we still draw on today. And that's you know so well known. Um, Taiwan, uh, the Taiwan government in general, and then later uh, um, uh, at the time it's called, um, uh, Today's National Taiwan University, the, the um, Taihoku Imperial University, the first uh, uh, and only uh, colonial university in Taiwan established in 1928. What distinguishes National Taiwan University is that the president and its, its leaders talk about how it's a, uh, you know, it's a um, knowledge production station for South China, Southeast Asia. Uh, and in, in Japan, you have uh, the three histories, national history, Japan, uh, Toyoshi or, or Chinese history, Korean history, and then Seoshi or uh, Western history. And in, in uh, the tai, uh, Taihoku Imperial University, the history department there uh, has um, Japan, uh, Toyoshi, China, and then Nayoshi or South Seas history. So really the origins of Japanese Southeast Asian studies, anthropology, history, archaeology, linguistics starts in, in Taiwan. And 
all of the materials and publications are still there. And in fact, if you're a Japanese Southeast Asianist, you've drawn on, you've gone to Taiwan or use publications from Taiwan because, uh, 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 so so I, I, I spend a lot of, a, a couple of chapters in my dissertation looking at um, the role of anthropologists and historians and how they're propagating similar narratives of, uh, you know, how how the Japanese had expanded into the South um, before Sakoku and clo you know the closed country policy, and how going back to Southeast Asia in the 1940s was a return to inevitable Japanese Southern advance. Um, some of these historians, like Iwao Seichi, uh, who who are teaching at uh, Taiyoku Imperial University, then go back to Tokyo after 1945, and and he's sort of the founding father of the the. the the, the historian of Southeast Asia and this the prob problem of, of you know the colonial origins of this knowledge production hasn't really been raised. So I, I, I've written a standalone article uh, that, that'll be coming out because I couldn't I, I, it was putting the book in like two separate separate directions and they were related but I, I took out the, the um, knowledge production. Uh, there, but really, not only Japanese language uh, publications, but it, the archive in South Southern Regions Library, they translated and also collected, you know, so many Western publications uh, in Dutch, in Spanish, that um, you know, it it, uh, it could be uh, argued that it's one of the largest Southeast Asian sort of archives. Um, that that's based in Taiwan uh, in the world. That's the same Iwao that did the study of the Nagasaki trip. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So so pe people who are looking at early modern Japan uh, know about know about know about Iwao and uh, his his mentor who who was uh, you know all of them were uh, pioneers and and the, and you see in Japan they did uh, east west relations so Japan and. Uh, the Portuguese or Spanish in the, the early modern period. And then when they went to Taiwan, they did a lot of local Taiwan history and then further Southeast Asian history. So that 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 is that's really fascinating and, and you know a whole book could be written on that. Well if I could ask another question. Um, at the beginning of your presentation you started off with uh, kind of influences and comparisons of different forms of empire. So you talk about the British Empire, um, France and Algeria. I wanted to ask, kind of at the end, having written the book, where you see your contribution is in terms of kind of global comparisons of empire. Do you see, I mean, from my perspective, I see that one of the, the, the great interventions that you have is showing how complicated empire is when you look at it from the perspective of its subjects. Um, given that you know, Taiwan served this really important role in advancing Japanese empire. Um, does this complicate kind of other histories of empires you see it? Do you, do you see yourself contributing in, in, in that fashion? Great. Uh, it's, a, it's a really tough question. Um, you know, in the, the many iterations of the introduction that I, that I wrote for the dissertation and later book, um, a lot of people, uh, you know, my 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 mentors or supporters, a lot of them ask for, you know, what is the what is the takeaway or intervention uh, for empires, generally speaking, not just the Japanese Empire, and uh, you know, it, it it it's it's one that's tough to answer because, you know, there are so many parallels with uh, British Indians or uh, French Algerians, etc. So I. I, I drew those parallels and then parallels not just with Taiwanese but also Koreans. Um, so uh, to try to to try to answer what might make this case unique, uh, um, you know, one one argument and and you know uh, 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 intervention is to say that it's very rare that uh, colonial subjects shared cultural, ethnic, linguistic ties with uh, a local population group. So um, within the Japanese empire, you have many Koreans going into Manchuria as farmers, as entrepreneurs, opium smugglers, etc. 
Uh, but, you know, you, you really have the, you, you still have a pretty stark ethnic linguistic divide between Manchurian Chinese and Koreans. And very few Manchurian Chinese are trying to become Korean subjects in the way that Chinese are trying to become Taiwanese subjects. Um, and you have, of course, Indians all over the world, uh, but rarely are they are they going into a place where they share or can be used as intermediaries from a linguistic perspective, right? So uh, there there are, and if you look at look at the um, Shanghai and then in Xiamen, there's a similar international settlement in, called Gulangyu, the uh, Gulangyu International Settlement, where it's you know a uh, 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 multinational um, sort of concession or, or safe space. Um, and you have a lot of British, uh, Indian, Sikh uh, policemen working uh, for, for this uh, settlement. But they don't share the same, uh, uh, they, they don't have access to the local uh, Chinese language in the way that Taiwanese who are later uh, 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 becoming policemen here. And so the Japanese pay them a much higher wage Indians start to complain about how their wages in the same police force are much lower because uh, the British are paying them, you know, half or a third of what the Taiwanese are, are, are getting paid. But the Japanese are also saying, look, these Taiwanese are way more useful. They should replace the Indians precisely because they can actually police and talk to the local Chinese population. So I think the Taiwanese subjects in China and then with the overseas Chinese in Southeast Asia is a, a really unique um, phenomenon that the Japanese are promoting that you don't see in uh, uh, the Indian case. Um, you might see it in French Algerians going to uh, Tunisia, etc. But uh, I think again, it's not as promoted uh, by the, the the colonial colonial state. Um, uh, so so that's that's one one answer of of what what makes the the Taiwan case uh, unique. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis Korea, as well as the the um, uh, Indian case, um, I I I also you know would say that that this is not in defense of Japanese imperialism or or to uh, uh, you know, apologize for them, uh, but it's at the point, especially with anti-Chinese uh, immigration laws and na uh, naturalization and nationality laws, where uh, the British are saying, look, you might be uh, Anglo-Chinese in Singapore or Hong Kong, but once you go in China, we're not going to uh, protect you or grant you that status of, of uh, a British subject in China. You're not going to um, enjoy extraterritorial rights. It, uh, and, and the Americans are doing that with Filipino Chinese at the turn of the uh, 20th century. It's at this sort of... Uh, sort of in, anti-Chinese racist uh, nationality uh, policies that the Japanese are going in the other direction of, of welcoming uh, Chinese to become Japanese in a way that they, they as Mimi, I think, suggested, almost don't. Or it's, you know, it, it's very different in the post-war period. Um, so, of course, that's, there's an instrumental... Uh, uh, reason for the Japanese to do this, but I do think that kind of imperial strategy, uh, and and that's why I try to use gateway subjects and and you know proxy subjects as as a key word that I think um, uh, uh, distinguishes this case or makes it make makes it a, a unique case for for, for global study of empires. Thank you. I think we have question for one last comment question. Yeah, Christoph, would you like to be the last to, word? I don't want to speak again if there's another question. But uh, happy to ask another question. <laughs> it seems like you're the only person, so go yes, ahead, Christoph. I, I want to cycle back to, I think, the second question online that you um, that you asked. And I want to uh, say to you, I want to press you a little bit on this, because I think if I remember correctly, that question was about how contemporary Taiwanese are looking at that history and whether or not they see a certain responsibility or so. And you answer, um, interestingly, of course, um, that in contemporary in the contemporary context of, of Taiwan, particularly post white terror, that it is mobilized, so to say, to again differentiate Taiwanese from the demands 
cultural and historical of quote unquote China, right? So we're, we're not, this is another puzzle to prove that we're not necessarily Chinese. We're, we're Taiwanese with our own identity. But if you turn this around, the, the other side of the coin, of course, is if that is the case, then this history exposes also Taiwanese, not only as victims of overly cynicization demands, but also as participants and perpetrators in pre-1945 pretty dark histories. Right? How is that negotiated in contemporary Taiwan? I want to hear that from you. <laughs> okay, so Professor Giebel asked a very challenging question. So if we accept this, this premise that um, this history is being recovered in sort of a, as evidence of a new Taiwanese identity, that you know, we, are, we are not Chinese because of this, this experience and this memory, then doesn't it implicate Taiwanese in, the, in a particularly dark imperial history? Um, how do we reconcile that? No, I, I you know, I haven't, um, I know there's a thriving scholarship on uh, Eastern European or, you know, um, different, uh, uh, you know, ethnic groups participating uh, in, in atrocities in, throughout Europe and that there probably is a lot more uh, uh, done in, in historical memory and responsibility. Uh, and I, I should look into it to try to see some of the parallels because uh, I hadn't thought of it in that way. I do think that, uh, I do think that uh, the story that I'm writing it is critical in that the oral histories are talking about them as, as victims, uh, you know, unknowingly participating or, or, you know, forced to participate, right? And of course, in the comfort women issue, uh, you know, I, 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 I stand by that, uh, but those who had something to gain out of the positions uh, and even talk about in the oral histories, what they did gain, uh, I do think are implicated. And, um, you know, it's, I try to address the respons war responsibility question at the epilogue by saying that uh, it's not that different from low-ranking Japanese soldiers right, or civilians. Uh, you can't just blame it on top-ranking military. There is agency, and whether or not I would have acted, I would have probably acted the same. We have to grant agency and choice in the fact that they, 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 you know, uh, the, you know, they part, they, they participated in, in, in this history. Um, so, in that sense. You know, these people who, whose oral histories I've drawn on have, have passed away. Perhaps if their children read it, I, I'm not sure how they would react to it. Um, but it's true. It, it's, not, it's not just a pro-Japanese story. Um, that said, <laughs> in the epilogue, I do talk about all these uh, Taiwanese servicemen. They didn't get uh, soldier pensions that their ethnic Japanese counterparts got in the post-war period. And I have, a, I have you know, even pictures of war compensation activists in the 60s and 70s who continue to lose their legal uh, lawsuits against uh, the Japanese government. And, and many Japanese are sympathetic and, and work you know, pro bono to try to uh, sue the Japanese government. But um, there is a sense that they've also been wronged by the coastal Japanese government or and wartime Japanese government. So that didn't make it into the presentation, but the epilogue is trying to show how uh, you know they really they really do face the brunt of going to a totally different ROC uh, uh, Taiwan that is not welcoming, while at the same time being totally abandoned by the Japanese government. Okay, um, well, now we're at time. So uh, I, before we end, I just wanted to mention that uh, Professor Sharani's book is available for free open access from Cornell University Press. If you're interested, please go ahead and download, access the book, read it. Um, Seiji spends a lot of money for that subvention. So <laughs> take advantage of, of it being free. Um, so thanks again, Professor Sharani. Uh, let's give him a minute. Well, thanks, thanks everyone. I really had a great time. So. Thanks for the questions.
Great. Thank you all.